What internet marketing expert should you spend your valuable time listening to? Listen to someone who has over 20 years of web marketing experience and hundreds of website marketing success stories. That man is Aaron Sparks from Site Strategics. And this is Edge of the Web Radio. We've had some success connecting with some new companies and authors here recently. All are focused on inbound marketing environments in one way, shape, or form. Uh, we'd like to introduce Jeffrey Roars. He's the author of the book, Audience. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you, guys. You're Happy more, to be here. More than welcome. More than welcome. Um, in your role as a vice president of marketing Vice President of Marketing Insights for Exact Target, and that is a Salesforce company. Jeff, actually, you spearhead research through thought leadership and content marketing efforts. Jeff has actually also co-created and continues to produce the the company's award-winning subscribers, fans, and followers research series. Jeff, welcome on board, man. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Can you tell us a little bit of your history in sign? Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I was calling it inbound marketing, but it's much larger than that. I, I truly appreciate uh, that perspective. How have you come to uh, Exact Target and give us a little bit of your history prior to that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of a weird one. Um, I am a uh, recovering attorney mm-hmm. uh, who uh, <laughs> in the mid 90s migrated over to LexisNexis at the time that they were switching from software to what we would now say in the cloud, mm-hmm. they were moving to Lexus.com for all their research. Mm-hmm. And I jumped over to a digital agency that imploded in the dot-com bubble, uh, threw out a parachute with a group of folks that went over to uh, an agency called Optium mm-hmm. uh, here in Cleveland, Ohio, where I'm based. And I became president of, of Optium and helped forge uh, our relationship as one of the early reseller partners of Exact Target, which at the time about 10 years ago, was strictly uh, an email marketing platform. Right. Uh, and after about three or so years at the helm of Exact Target, uh, I actually um, was approached by Scott Dorsey, the CEO of Exact Target, to see if I'd want to come on board. Mm-hmm. And the rest, they say, is history. I've been with the company almost seven years, and in that time have been overseeing our thought leadership efforts. And our marketing insights team is really one that works uh, across the organization, um, it really kind of a small live team, but trying to surface uh, thought leadership and great insights, uh, not only for content marketing purposes, for public speaking, mm-hmm. uh, and and really just to help our, our clients and those folks who might be clients think around the corners of an ever-changing digital marketing landscape. That's quite a perspective. And, and the, the fact of the matter is you've found over the course of that seven years, um, more and more need for that type of insight. And I, I would only fair to guess that you've you found yourself starting to be become that that front line of communication for the companies that engage with you, um, that social media and mobile interaction and, and, and developing uh, almost a one-on-one type of, of consumer relationship was, was starting to be uh, necessary for companies, wasn't it? You got it. Um, you know, really, our evolution into, you know, from email to mobile, social, web, uh, you know, all those technologies um, is because more and more the, the data that you can get from, you know, a permission-based relationship with a consumer can be used to, to fuel marketing across a wide variety of online channels. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, email was the principal one-to-one marketing tool. Uh, for, you know, kind of the direct relationship. And, you know, in the, in the nascent days of, of online marketing, uh, the website in search was kind of the one for, you know, uh, targeting folks with whom you didn't have a relationship. Now as you look at this highly fragmented environment, there are a lot more direct relationships. There are a lot more channels that you can have. Mm-hmm. And my focus with the subscribers, fans, and followers research was to first delineate what do consumers want from brands and how do those relationships, subscriber, fan, follower, differ in terms of expectations? And now with the book Audience, I'm really honing in on this idea that um, that brands need to put somebody on the front line of audience development. We've all been doing it in very siloed types of uh, fashion because mm-hmm. that's how we've had to evolve. We've had to have somebody on email, somebody on social, et cetera. But it's, it's now time that we have somebody horizontal across the organization saying, hey, are are we developing our email subscribers to the best of our ability? Are we increasing 
the size, engagement, and value of those audiences? What about social? What about mobile? And um, when you put somebody on that wall, uh, it really, I think, ups your game as opposed to just assuming that folks in the channels are doing it. They're doing the best they can, but oftentimes they're so close to the actual channel and the content, they think it's a win just to get it out there into mm -hmm. the ether. Mm -hmm. but the win is to get it out there into the ether with an engaged audience who's going to do something with it, maybe mm -hmm. turn it into earned media or turn it into a direct sale for you. And it's almost, in, I, I, I probably envision here, that it's also inverted that where the individual individual channels were, were kind of uh, developing their own unique audience per every channel they were working inside of, um, you're now finding that the audience that you're trying to engage with is is working in all those different spaces. So you literally have to have a consistent message and a consistent topical focus as you're communicating on behalf of the companies or, or on behalf of your own company because at some at a certain point in time, that audience is not going to be inside of that Inside of that Twitter blast is not going to be in, in front of that email, but if you're if you're having a consistent brand message, you're going to catch them in one way, shape, or form through their their through their cohabitation inside of these different channels. Yeah, what you're referring to there is something I call shelf space. Mm -hmm. That that brands companies need to now own more uh, shelf space with their consumers. It mm -hmm. used to be enough that you would get the email address. Well, now, you know, if you, if you truly want to have more opportunities to touch uh, a very mobily enabled audience, mm -hmm. you need to be thinking about, you know, boy, what are, the, what are the situations where I'd want to get that person to subscribe via SMS so I can say, send text messages? You know, how do I get them to become fans on Facebook so that I can have them sharing positive experiences mm -hmm. with our brand and talking about it with friends and family? How do I get them to follow me? on uh, Twitter so that I can get some great amplification. And I think what you'll find is that, you know, the client or the, the, the customers or, or prospects who kind of graduate to multiple relationships ultimately become the best customers because they're opening up more channels. And our, our research has found that with the growth of social media, it hasn't actually hurt uh, the use of email as a direct marketing channel. So in yeah. fact, yeah. what consumers are doing is they're opening more channels up for potential relationships with marketers, but it's important for your listeners to, to understand and embrace the fact that all of those channels are permission-based. Mm -hmm. So the consumer is ultimately in control of the on-off switch. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, in the book I get into this notion of kind of three dim dimensions of audience growth. You know, it's size, it's engagement, and it's value. Mm -hmm. Because it's not enough to just have a bigger audience. You need a bigger audience that's engaged because in email, in mobile, in social, if you don't have an engaged audience, your email doesn't get through or it gets put into a, a folder where it can get lost. Mm -hmm. In social, it just doesn't get seen in the waterfall of available information that's there. And in mobile, your app might get downloaded, but it's never, ever used again. So engagement's an important uh, metric. And then that last one, value, is really specific to your business. You might be the type of company where Facebook just doesn't have any value to you, and that's fine. But you've got to figure that out for yourself and find those social channels or those other channels that do have more value and make sure that you put your emphasis there in terms of growing your direct audience. You know, you lead with uh, the concept of audiences as assets, and I would really want to strengthen this particular concept because it, it does come across our desk regularly that um, – a company or a decision maker of a company doesn't really value the audience that's inside of Facebook because it doesn't apply to what they're doing or or they just don't see the, the relevancy of social media as it applies to their business model or, or, their, or their industry for that matter. Um, the concept of audiences as an asset, um, it really does open up a lot of eyes for traditional thinking because what used to be a well, one-way direction of brand, it's now turning everybody on their ear because they have to listen and they have to engage. And that's a whole other discipline uh, for, for companies. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm very keen on trying to get more companies and certainly all the readers of the book to embrace an audience or an asset-based philosophy of audience. Um, normally when you talk of marketing assets, the first thing that would come to mind in most companies is going to be their creative assets, their brand assets, their content assets. But what I'm truly talking about with audiences is an asset that has monetary value. 
the simple back of the napkin math is if I have an, an email subscriber base of a million people and I can do the calculations to determine that an average customer's lifetime customer value or LCV is three is say 30 bucks mm -hmm. but a, a, a customer who's also subscribed to email is worth 33 and I know the Delta is three dollars and I know three dollars times a million is three million that's a three million dollar asset mm. and, and and that's that's language that appeals to the C-suite, to the CEO, oh, to the CFO. And it's not a common way that most marketers have been talking. Um, most marketers are talking about, boy, this campaign had great ROI. And mm. ROI is wonderful, but it's very finite, and it's very campaign-focused. The, the concept of proprietary audience development is DNA level and permanent. It is a long-term commitment, and it is about getting your organization to understand that look, because of our ability to go direct and have all this instantaneous worldwide distribution of content, we now have the ability to build direct audiences. Audiences have value. The, the very simple way to prove to your, your CMO or whomever that audiences have value is, you know, well, what we pay for advertising. Because what is advertising? Advertising is renting the attention of an audience. Mm -hmm. And that audience was aggregated by uh, a television company, a, uh, an online website, uh, a newspaper, a radio, what have you. They're, they're literally in the business of audiences. Um, you know, advertisers paid last year $3.8 million for a Super Bowl ad for 30 seconds yep. of per, you know, perceived attention of this very, very large aggregated audience. So the paid advertising model proves that audiences have value. What I'm trying to do is now focus that on the audiences that you can build and get you to begin valuing them as assets. Absolutely. And you know what? We're going to be talking about uh, how you can actually build your audience for your own company uh, right after this with Jeff Roars with his book, Audience. Today, especially, we're talking to to a, a thought leader inside of, of developing that type of insight into uh, audi uh, your, your audience success. And this is Jeffrey Roars of Exact Target. Thank you so much for uh, rejoining us here. Thank you. Uh, you know what? Jeff has a book out. He's about to come out. It's called Audience, and it's focused on on really understanding that 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 marketing is now focused on developing and engaging and and interacting with uh, your social media audience. Your your now well, far beyond social media. It's it's where your audience of your of your industry cohabitates, and and how to actually put together a battle plan to be able to engage on all the different channels in, in which they they participate, right, Jeff? That's right. Um, you know, it's it's interesting as I've been working on the book uh, because I went into it with the idea that I was going to write, you know, principally just a book inspired by our subscribers, fans, and followers research. And mm -hmm. what I ended up writing was something far broader and something that really, I hope, is, is going to become a talking point uh, for a lot of marketers next year. And that is, you know, really the, the notion that now that you can have these direct audiences, email subscribers, Facebook fans, Twitter followers, mm -hmm. YouTube subscribers, uh, like, you know, you gentlemen, you've got radio listeners, podcast mm -hmm. listeners, right? All of these different types of folks. Um, that's great, but who's in charge of them? Who's, who's in charge of making sure that you're, you're growing, uh, as I discussed last segment, mm -hmm. really size, engagement, and value? And uh, there's just so many opportunities out there. I think with a lot of companies, they get overwhelmed. Yeah. And so, you know, the hope is, is if you can help folks understand that, look, no, job number one is to make the sale, Right. But we can ask our paid media, we can ask our owned media to do a lot more than it's doing right now, and that is don't just make the sale, also build the audience for the next time you have to go out so that instead of being so dependent on paid media, mm -hmm. you're going to have more of your own audience to push a button and send a message to, and it's permission-based, and these are folks who want to hear from you and engage with you. Yeah, I'd uh, go so far as to to go one step further with that is that if you're utilizing paid marketing to be able to build that audience, you have even you've got a greased wheel to actually shoot even further. So it's not no le no longer a scalable su success that you have certain conversion rates, certain certain percentages that you're yeah, you're getting that sale, and then you can put more money in and expect that you know proportional growth. You're really building an audience that can champion what you're broadcasting out there, and that goes far beyond 
a, a proportional growth uh, or a scalable solution. Uh, this really is, uh, you know, you're getting carried on the backs of yeah. people that are, are, are promoting your brand. Yeah, I, I actually refer to this as the hybrid marketing era. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and I'm a big fan of Mad Men, and I often use Don Draper as my foil to, to <laughs> basically lay out there that, look, paid advertising is the fossil fuel of marketing. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you think about what paid advertising is, you've got a third party going out there and mining or pumping out of you know the consumer audience attention. And they aggregated that attention for you, and you could pull up to the pump and fill your brand full of it and drive off. And that was called, you know, buying advertising. But at some point, the gas tank, you know, goes dry at the end of 30 seconds or 60 seconds, and you've got to go back and fill up again. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that model. It's just that you are addicted to uh, a third-party source for your business energy. And you can't, you can't um, uncouple from it either. Exactly. And then what changed with the Internet is that it awakened us to renewable energy sources for our business, these owned media assets like websites mm-hmm. and you know, all of these social channels and everything else where, you know, oh, wow, we can put this out ourselves. We can put out a video. That's, that's wonderful. And, you know, the, the promise was it was like, you know, a solar panel and we just collect this energy or it was like a, a wind turbine. You put it up and consumer energy would spin it for you. Of course, what we've realized is that there is more competition than ever for consumer attention. And so it's harder and harder to, you know, have a viral home run, let alone even small balls, singles and doubles. So when I say the hybrid marketing era, what I mean is that we are we are the generation of marketers who have to figure out how do we how do we leverage the best of paid media, mm-hmm. merge it with the best of the renewable uh, media that's out there in the form of our owned channels to get a bigger, better result than perhaps the sum of the parts. And the hybrid marketer figures that out. And, you know, it is very analogous to, you know, a Tesla hmm. Model S. What is a Tesla? It's an electric car, right? Yeah. But it actually has to plug into the grid to charge. But it gets some of its energy from the fact it's in motion or it's braking or what have you. So it's generating energy from all these different parts. And that's what we have to do as marketers today. And, and the most successful companies in their spaces are going to be the ones who figure out how to be most efficient in their aggregation and use of audience attention. You know, what's challenging and what I love is that um, this environment breaks the mold of, of, uh, again, traditional marketing um, conventions because every brand's recipe of that hybrid model is different, Mm -hmm. is that the it's like a topographical map. Each and every brand's uh, interactions, as well as just the audience itself, has a different set of wants, a different set of needs, and it and it can be the the execution can be repeatable at least to, from the aspect of the tools that you use, but the content and the engagement is authentic. It's 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 not you can't repeat the exact same thing for another business and hope for success. Very true and. You know, I'll take it a step further, and I will. I will say that you could have two very similarly situated companies mm-hmm. in the exact same industry vertical, mm-hmm. and one of them, because of the nature of their brand, could knock it out of the park on Facebook, mm-hmm. while the other could just find Facebook to be a stone cold environment. Mm-hmm. And the reason is, is that that first brand perhaps has a much more personable culture. Perhaps it has a you know a brand mascot mm-hmm. that is whimsical or fun or green uh, and has I, or, yeah. or, or green <laughs> or edible, um, you know. And you know that's the interesting thing now is there are so many channels yep. that you know you can't just simply copy what the other guy's doing. And yeah, exactly, you have to look at your product and your culture and your brand, and you may have to make some fundamental DNA level kind of changes in order to have the kind of success sometimes that your competitors are having. Yeah, and, they're, um, yeah. and That's where a lot of the social media horror stories come from, is that you have brands who think they're like Oreo, mm-hmm. do whimsical things, and it falls flat because they just, humor is not a part of their brand or they're very ham-handed in how they do that. Right, all right, that's the thing, is that, that it's, it's the task of marketers to actually earn their stripes now. What What used to be able to be easily uh conducted brand execution 
because it's been done before, just you just boil it down to a little bit lesser degree, does not fit this particular process. They have to earn their stripes, they have mm-hmm. to do it, and they have to pay attention to the successes and see what they're doing wrong and, and improve that execution. Uh, I think I mean, it's, 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 it's the time of marketers to really step up to the game. You're absolutely right. It's going to take a, a new type of strategic creativity, um, and it's also going to take a lot of collaboration in larger marketing organizations. It's one thing to be you know, kind of a marketing department of one. Um, you know, oftentimes when I talk to those folks, they, they feel very, you know, overburdened. And I completely get that. But mm-hmm. there is the benefit of being a marketing department of one is you know you have to be efficient and you can focus on, um, you know, really what moves the needle because you're very close to the business. In larger marketing departments, what you end up with are these siloed entities who don't speak with each other and therefore they're not optimizing messaging, audience development, yep. Uh, content leveraging, all of those things uh, across the enterprise. So, you know, collaboration is is key in proprietary audience development. You've got to have your advertising folks inviting, you know, the social media and email and other people, folk, uh, those folks to the table. And, again, that's one of the reasons why I think in larger marketing organizations I'm expecting to see the rise of the director of audience development. Yeah. Because rather than having, you know, five different people in a meeting – you would have that person there knowing all of the different proprietary audiences that you could execute against and making suggestions of, you know, hey, we have this television commercial. We need a really good call to action at the end. And that's something that brand advertisers have often been adverse to. You know, it's enough to them to create awareness or brand, uh, you know, brand visibility. Uh, my strong feeling is you, you just can't get away with that anymore. No, you can't. You've got, a, you've got attention. Uh, it's very fleeting. And the other thing is, it's very important to recognize is every type of marketing, thanks to the smartphone, is now direct marketing. Because for those people who have the smartphone in their hand, you've got the ability to drive them to a destination or engage with them mm-hmm. in ways that you didn't previously. And uh, you're missing out on opportunities if you assume that your audience is just sitting there. And Google, I don't know how true this is, but they had research last year that said 70% of the U.S. television viewing population uh, was watching television with either a device in hand, like a smartphone or yep. a tablet, yep. or a laptop nearby. That's absolutely true. Jeff, can we ask you to stay on uh, for our last segment here with Edge of the Web? Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. On our final segment here, we wanted to uh, thank Jeffrey Roars uh, to join us uh, through this entire show. He has a, his new book, Audience. He's the Vice President of Marketing Insights over at Exact Target. And uh, we've been talking uh, throughout the uh, uh, the the, uh, the the hour here regarding a lot of insight into building audiences and understanding a brand's audience. So thank thank you so much for uh, continuing on this conversation, Jeff. Thank you, enjoying it greatly. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we really wanted to just first make sure that everybody knew how to get a hold of your book and how to how to find you inside of social media and online. Can you give us some? Uh, key uh, points there. Yeah, so uh, folks who are interested in learning more about the book and perhaps viewing the book trailer, you can go to audiencepro.com, yep. and we'll be building out resources there. I'm blogging pretty regularly, uh, and there'll be a, a number of things that we're doing, like a, a Pinterest board where we're collecting photos of audience acquisition techniques in the wild and kind of providing some feedback and our thoughts on those. Mm-hmm. So the book is meant to you know, convey this notion of proprietary audience development, explain many of the channels where you can build your direct audiences and then send you off in the last section with kind of a roadmap, an initial uh, roadmap on how you can start moving yourself towards building audiences. But it's it's certainly not a book with an, a hard finish, right, because it's an ongoing process, and that's what we're trying to do over at Audience Pro. And then um, certainly, you know, feel free to follow me at jkro. HRS mm-hmm. uh, on Twitter. And um, the other thing is we're, we're going to have a new free piece of research, our audience growth survey, uh, which is the 22nd uh, part in our uh, ongoing subscribers, fans, and followers research survey. Mm-hmm. And um, that's going to be available next week. Uh, and folks can download that at www.exacttarget.com forward slash SFF, short for subscribers, fans, followers. Excellent, excellent. So you certainly want to pay attention and grab up that book whenever it comes out. Um, and November eleventh. Uh, there November you are. <laughs> that, that's the day right there. Pre-order now. <laughs> 
Yep, absolutely, and we're gonna we're gonna pick up a couple copies for uh, the internal site strategics office. Uh, we certainly like to 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 take in a, a good deal of the the thought leadership that we that we uh, interview here on the edge, and we certainly ha- did have a good conversation focusing on on what it means to uh, to actually market to your audience. Now it's it's no longer mass broadcasting. It's it's focused on the cons- very fractionalized type of channel communication inside. You know, uh, email inside of social media inside mm-hmm. of different environments and and really understanding that the need is now upon us for for all levels of brand all levels of size of company to be able to have a director of audience communicator communicator be able to have consistent messaging across all these different channels right jeff absolutely um and the great thing is is that audiences are truly a renewable resource so um, if you feel like you're behind, then mm-hmm. there's no time like the present to start building them in email, social, and, and mobile channels. I had one final question that I wanted to bring up to you, Jeff, and we hadn't we hadn't talked about it specifically, but it was, it, it has to do with local proximity uh, advertising in, inside of of all the, the the geospace where people are and the uh, the interaction for. Uh, for brands to be able to communicate, you know, obviously we got Foursquare out there. That's 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 it's in that space. But the the obviously Google is also marketing directly to where you're searching from. I just wanted to see if you had any insights inside inside of that space as as we're talking about multiple multiple channel marketing. Well, you know, certainly um, apps and, and and others are are trying to leverage your your geolocation to yep. provide more and more targeted information to you. Um, but, you know, relative to the topic of, you know, building your own audiences, um, you know, certainly it, it becomes another reason to, you know, not neglect text messaging and SMS mm-hmm. uh, because you're increasingly going to be able to uh, essentially um, geofence uh, areas and provide text messages to people just within certain geographic areas. And if you are a franchise organization, for instance, you may want to be managing that at a corporate level and yep. then, you know, map out territories so that you don't have to rely on the individual franchisees to send out information. Rather, you can be doing that at a corporate level, ensuring message integrity, ensuring, ensuring that response and interest is then routed back to the franchisees or, you know, uh, remote sales reps. Absolutely. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we're only really you know, seeing the tip of the iceberg on locality and location-based uh, targeting right now. You know, certainly Foursquare comes to mind with everybody, but there are a lot more little nuanced uh, uses of it. Uh, and as consumers get more comfortable with it, and that's going to be the key, is that there's got to be full disclosure. You have to make sure that you're letting consumers know what they're getting into. Yep. Where you can run afoul is when you surprise them with knowing where they are. Uh, yeah, that's uh, kind of so creepy. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's that, the creepy factor in location-based stuff can get you know pretty, uh, pretty weird pretty quick. Um, and so, you know, I'm a big fan of permission across the board and disclosure across the board. Fantastic. So communicate, communicate, communicate. Well, thank you so much.